Good evening, this is Brass Tax. I'm Zaka Jacob. Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine has now entered its fifth day. And one thing is clear. There is a Ukrainian resistance. The Ukrainian army and the Ukrainian people have not surrendered quickly like Putin had hoped. They are putting up a fight and how. Some of these images have gone viral on social media. What it has also done is Putin's actions seem to have galvanized a divided Europe. Ceasefire talks were today held in the town of Gomel. This is on the border between Ukraine and Belarus. But after three and a half hours of talks, there's not been any significant breakthrough. The fear now is, citing a lack of breakthrough, there could be a stepped-up military offensive, particularly in Kiev, the capital. Russian troops have already surrounded the capital. So how will this story play out over the next few days? Uh, on this show, a little later on, in this broadcast, I'll be joined by one of the most uh, renowned foreign policy voices, international columnist, best-selling author, and of course, the host of GPS on CNN, Farid Zakaria. But first, the story of day five of Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Can diplomacy end war? Remember, there is a, an emergency, an extraordinary session of the United Nations General Assembly that's happening right now in New York, even as we speak. But on the ground in Ukraine, it seems like the blitzkrieg that Vladimir Putin taught uh, would happen same time last week when he uh, ordered uh, the forces, the Russian forces to invade Ukraine. That hasn't quite played out according to his plan, at least not certainly uh, in these last five days. Let me now go across uh, to Ambassador G. Parth Sarthi, former diplomat with the Ministry of External Affairs. Professor Brahma Chalani is a strategic affairs expert. Let me start with you, uh, Ambassador Parth Sarthi. Uh, I think when we spoke Thursday uh, when Putin launched the invasion of Ukraine, it was almost like a foregone conclusion that, uh, you know, it would be just a matter of days before the Ukrainians surrender. Uh, but given what we are seeing on social media and other independent reports coming out from there of uh, resistance, not just by the Ukrainian army, but also by the Ukrainian people, uh, do you think Putin did not factor in this kind of resistance from Ukraine? And the longer and more protected it gets, do you think that uh, would, would be disadvantage to uh, Vladimir Putin? Well, I think, uh, I don't think he factored in this form of resistance. Uh, and it has been very strong, these, uh, these sentiments. But it is, I don't think you should, you know, exaggerate this as a factor. Because the day the Russians move in in strength, it's a different matter. More importantly, I think what is important is that they are holding talks on the border, mm -hmm. on Big Brother's territory, which is, very familiar with. They should, they could have certainly, and uh, everybody would support it, go about it, uh, have gone about it in a more uh, organized and timely manner. Uh, this, yes, this, uh, the uh, West has, jo has uh, joined in, in strength. Yeah. And uh, you're even seeing countries like Sweden, which were not involved in this. Mm -hmm. To that extent, it is a diplomatic setback. And I, I'm reasonably certain that that will uh, it will be followed up in the UN General Assembly. But in the UN General Assembly, we were also uh, have had our problems during the Bangladesh crisis and so on. So I think ultimately this has to be settled on the ground. And uh, let, let's not forget some of the things the Americans uh, Biden has talked with on uh, recently on. You know, they're both being nuclear powers and responsible and so on. Mm -hmm. I think ultimately the two superpowers will have to find a way. These, these sanctions I'll come to in the end. I think, uh, yes, it will hurt many people. But just remember one thing. For years, we have had a bilateral rupee payment agreement. So where it concerns our essentials, we, 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 we can utilize that. 
And one last word on the American thing. After all, uh, we have been at the receiving end of Americans for a long time. But right now we are both on the same wicket uh, when dealing in the quad and with the Chinese. Okay. Uh, with the Russians, it's a different ball I, game. I, I want to ask uh, Brahma Chalani, one of the things that Ambassador Patsarty referred to, maybe it was an unintended consequence, we don't know, but it seems like it's galvanized uh, Europe in particular. Europe was strangely very divided, uh, not just on the question of Russia, but on a whole host of other things. But now countries from you know France, UK, all the way to Sweden are all coming together, whether it's through monetary measures, some of them even direct uh, military support to Ukraine, are sort of coming together in a way we haven't seen in Europe for a number of years and decades. Uh, do you think Putin did not factor that uh, into, into his calculus, as it were? I doubt that because uh, he knew that uh, his invasion of uh, Ukraine would uh, solidify the Western bloc, lead to sanctions. Biden had actually unveiled the kind of sanctions that the US and the West would impose on Russia. Obviously, those did not uh, deter Russia because the US and the Western bloc have overused the sanctions card against Russia and that sanctions instrument has become blunted. But some of the reaction that is coming from Europe seems uh, a bit crazy. For example, Germany has unveiled plans to remilitarize. Yeah. It has even announced an immediate investment of 100 billion euros in buying arms, including American F-35s and Israeli drones. Uh, some of the reaction is completely, um, uh, you know, completely uh, outlandish. Um, the focus should be on how to contain the conflict, how to end the war. And right now, the military situation is at a very critical point. In fact, the moment of truth has arrived for both sides, but especially Russia. The capital, Kyiv, has been surrounded from all sides by Russian forces. Satellite pictures show miles-long Russian military convoys outside Kyiv, ready to pound the city if ordered. Will urban warfare be averted? Urban warfare with Russian forces facing guerrilla attacks will be hellish, exacting a heavy human toll and destroying entire neighborhoods. So in that sense, the talks today are crucial. They will decide whether urban warfare will be averted. Another important point to note that Russia has sent no forces to Ukraine's entire west yeah. or to its central regions. Russia has mounted attack lines into just three regions of Ukraine. This could suggest that Russia's military aim is not to annex the entire Ukraine, but to bring about regime change by controlling Kyiv. So the choice for Russia is either to choke Kyiv without its forces entering it, or to try to capture Kyiv, even if it means getting into bloody hand-to-hand -hand combat. Mm -hmm. So the coming days are going to be very critical in this war. No, so uh, what, I'm, what I'm curious to know is, uh, and I think you know, various sort of referenda that have happened in Ukraine over the last number of years, uh, and more so after Vladimir Zelensky became president, uh, clearly indicate that a majority opinion, uh, at least in large parts of urban Ukraine, uh, do not view themselves as, as aligned to Russia. In fact, they want the opposite. They want to be aligned more uh, with Europe. Uh, so if the strategic objective is to change the regime, he, he doesn't like uh, the current regime, he thinks it's too pro-Western, uh, even if he's able to, to do that momentarily or, or temporarily, uh, Ambassador Patsarthi, how long will that last? Because ultimately, it's 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 a it's a, a whole number of people, a whole few million of millions of people who who do not want to be aligned with Russia. So even if he has a puppet regime, quote unquote, how how much credibility will that have, and how long will that last anyway? Look, uh, it, the Russians have a great deal of resilience, but more importantly, the, you are talking of losing human lives. To me, that's a sad sad state of affairs. I think the negotiations should should take place. And uh, look, uh, you know, we don't take too kindly when uh, 
countries like Nepal uh, in our neighborhood start playing games against us with Pakistan or with China. Uh, the Russians, uh, the other republics, are they're not interfering. Every one of their Islamic republics is more than happy with the Russians and does not want to go together with the United States or anyone else. Bear that in mind, five Islamic republics. Okay. The same is true elsewhere. Yes, uh, in uh, this case, they, you do have a situation where uh, they uh, wanted to be in the American camp, which is rather strange because civilizationally and in religious terms, the Russian Orthodox Church, Christianity is what has bound them together. They, they have not sort of been at war with each other. Mm -hmm. They're Slavs, both of them racially. So I think this is a very peculiar situation. And, uh, you know, having one looks back on this, uh, it will require many books to be written later okay. by uh, CIA authors I'll, about... I'll give the final about. word to um, uh, not, not, Professor not right Chilani. Uh, just in terms of, you know, we've had the first round of talks today, three, three and a half hours they spoke. There's been seemingly no resolution. Do you expect something to give in the next few days? Very quickly, sir. I expect um, Russia to, to make a difficult military choice. And the choice is basically to prevent civilian casualties on a large scale when before the, much before the invasion began, the Pentagon's assessment was that right in the initial phase, thousands of civilians would die in a Russian invasion. That hasn't happened. According to the Ukrainian Interior Ministry, up to yesterday, 352 civilians have died. And if you look at, if you compare this invasion with America's invasion of Iraq, that invasion was preceded by a 40 day air bombing campaign before Americans put any troops on the ground. Yeah. In this case, we had, this is only the fifth day of an invasion and the urban, principal urban centers have been surrounded in the north, the, um, the, the south and in the east. The real issue is this, that Russia, at least in Russian view, Ukraine is the cradle of Russian civilization, especially Kyiv. And the Russian focus would be on avoiding large scale civilian casualties. All right. But there's also a larger issue that's happening, which I think we should not forget while looking at the military picture, which is that the US and the Western focus is now entirely shifting to European security. The US is pouring military resources into Europe, and the main casualty of such a shift is likely to be Asian security. Mm -hmm. First, it'll compound America's strategic overstretch, will distract America from the China challenge, and the new Cold War that is uh, emerging will open greater space for Chinese expansionism. It will right. also advance um, China's economic power and energy security by making Beijing the main beneficiary of the new Western sanctions on Russia. All right. India may have no dog in the fight, yet it will not be able to escape the larger it strategic could, it could have an unintended of the conflict uh, over Ukraine. Out. All right. And, uh, and, and if I'm, I could just end by saying that this will complicate India's ability to walk a diplomatic tightrope. Okay, we'll leave it at that uh, for now. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chalani, as well as uh, G. Partsarthi, for speaking with us. India has, at least at the United Nations Security Council, tried to walk that tightrope uh, by saying that it wants a de-escalation of tensions, wants both parties to come to the dialogue table as quickly as possible. But uh, it did abstain from voting. Uh, in that critical vote. Let me now go across uh, to somebody who's one of the most renowned voices uh, in foreign policy, international columnist, best-selling author, and of course the host of Fareed Zakaria GPS on CNN. Fareed Zakaria, thank you so much for speaking with us uh, here on News 18. Uh, first things first, it's day five of Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine. There is an unexpected resistance from the Ukrainian army and the Ukrainian people. What is your assessment of how this conflict has gone on for these last five days? It seems clear that the Russians, uh, the Russian army is facing unanticipated difficulties. 
Uh, and one can see this in the fact that they have not supplied uh, their army in the way that one would have uh, one would have done if one was expecting a long and difficult slog. So they clearly expected that they were going to have a kind of lightning breakthrough where their forward troops were going to go in. Kiev was uh, was going to collapse. The government would fall. The cities would fall to them. Um, that didn't happen. The Ukrainians fought much harder and more fiercely, were better armed and better prepared. So now they are resupplying their troops. Uh, you see these, these videos of long supply lines. What that tells you is that this is plan B. Plan A was meant to be that they moved so fast that they did not need those long supply lines. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, Ukraine is outmatched something like 10 to 1. The Russian army is the largest land army in Europe. It is, Putin has rebuilt it and modernized it very substantially. They have very lethal, lethal weaponry. And the really interesting question is, are they now going to start a much more indiscriminate kind of warfare in order to, to force the, the fall of cities like Kiev? In other words, are they going to start bombing civilian areas indiscriminately? My guess is that we are about to see a very ugly phase of the war, um, which is why Putin raised his nuclear forces to combat alert. It was talks uh, in the border between Ukraine and Belarus. It hasn't led to much. But what is the signal that Putin is trying to send to the West? And again, I come back to what made him start this war, because we initially thought it was about liberating this one part of Ukraine, the eastern part. There's been an insurgency running there for a number of years. Uh, so that was his limited objective. But it's clear now that that was not the objective, uh, that this is some kind of full throttle invasion of Ukraine. I, that's a very good point. I think that Putin, until uh, recently, had seemed like a very aggressive um, Russian nationalist, but rational, calculating. Uh, what appears to be the case here is this is a kind of old-fashioned land grab to, uh, to fulfill a kind of czarist dream that he has of unifying the, you know, the Russian empire, recreating the Russian empire. Because as you say, it doesn't make any sense if all he wanted was to make sure that NATO, uh, Ukraine would not be a member of NATO. That mm -hmm. was achievable in very different ways. If all he wanted were those two provinces, uh, that was achievable. That's, that's what he did in Georgia. He essentially took the two Russian-speaking parts of Georgia, mm -hmm. uh, declared them as independent republics, uh, and pulled, pulled back. So this feels much more like a atavistic nationalist drive to force Ukraine back into the Russian Empire. And he's always been emotional, uh, neuralgic about, about Ukraine. Ukraine to him is indivisible from Russia. So my own sense is that, at least in the last few months, all these diplomatic uh, efforts have been ploys. I think you can go back 15 years and say, maybe you know, the, 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 there could have been a better accommodation with Russia and the West. But certainly in the last few years, and definitely in the last three months, all these negotiating ploys on the uh, on on the part of Putin appear to have been stalling tactics while he gathered his forces, while he prepared his army for what he wants, which is essentially a kind of takeover of Ukraine, a decapitation of the government, perhaps an absorption into Russia. But more likely, he wants to turn Ukraine into Belarus, a kind of pliable client state that will do exactly what he wants when he wants. So, so now as he stands at the end of day five of this military invasion, and he's got to ha make this very difficult choice, as you said, uh, does he go in full throttle and attack and, and capture the capital, Kiev? Because that would also mean a large number of uh, unintended consequences, civilian casualties being top of that. Uh, you think he's prepared for the next few months of you know, urban warfare, uh, Russian troops taking on guerrilla armies of, of Ukrainians? I, I think he's prepared for it. I think that, remember, the Russians fought a brutal war in Chechnya. Um, they killed about 200 
250,000 people, mostly civilians. They leveled Grozny, uh, one of the you know oldest cities in the world. Uh, they, the Russian army can be pretty brutal. Uh, Putin does not seem to be a person who shirks from that. Um, b- but you never know. I mean, if the Ukrainians will fight back. It's harder to do, by the way, in Ukraine than in a place like Afghanistan. The geography of Ukraine is very flat. It's not particularly hospitable to an insurgency, but uh, they will hide in buildings. They will hide in, you know, uh, street alleys. Uh, and they will, you know, as we can see, they, w- they will fight. Um, the, the other piece of this is the, the, the sanctions, which are proving to be more painful and lethal than I think Putin might have expected. The most unexpected one that, the, the, you know, the, the West has done, I use the word West in general, because Japan, South Korea, uh, Australia are all joining in, um, have been the targeting of uh, the, the Russian government's central bank reserves. Putin had built a war chest, $600 billion, that he thought would make his economy sanctions proof. But the, the, the targeted uh, efforts against the Russian central bank have been almost like an arrow that has penetrated through that armor. Um, It appears as though the Russians will not have much access to those $600 billion of of, uh, reserves, which is going to cause, I think, in the the next few days, you are likely to see a real panic in Russia. People withdrawing money from banks, classic bank runs, things like that, because, I mean, the ruble is in free fall. They dare not open the stock market because it is collapsing. Interest rates have been doubled already, and they will probably have to go up again. So Russia is right now moving into the territory of a country like Venezuela or perhaps even Zimbabwe, um, which is a very uncomfortable place for a country that thinks of itself as part of the modern world, 150 million people, sophisticated businesses, educated population. uh, And one wonders whether that has any deterrent effect. What do you make of the response from Europe in particular? You mentioned some of the decisions and and measures taken by the United States, whether it's the financial sanctions, the economic moves and so on. Uh, But Europe, a country like Germany, for example, committing $100 billion to modernize its army, procure state-of-the-art weaponry. Do you think Putin, through his actions, has galvanized Europe in a way that we haven't seen for, for years now? For decades, uh, uh, Jacob, it's, it's extraordinary. The United States has been trying to get Germany to increase its defense budget for, for almost 35 years now. And in one, one week, Vladimir Putin has been able to do what, what four American presidents were not able to do. Um, but it's much beyond Germany. I Notice, by the way, in Germany, even the Green Party voted for this increase in, in defense budget and sending arms to, uh, to Ukraine, uh, something the Germans have never done since 1945. I think that if you look at wh- how Europe is being transformed by this, it may be the most lasting effect of, uh, of this invasion. Europe is talking now about strategic uh, national security policy, rebuilding its defenses, forward deployment of troops, all the things that the United States has been urging it to do and that, frankly, will make for a much more uh, stable and viable international system. Europe has been the great silent actor on, in, the European, uh, in, the, in the international system. It's a quarter of global GDP. It actually spends a fair amount of money on defense, but it is not coordinated in a strategic way. If that begins to happen, you now have, slowly, the emergence of a new superpower in the world. We, we talk a lot about the superpowers we know of, but th- this is the latent superpower that has liberal values, that is wants to maintain the rule-based international system, but that has always been a passive non-actor on the international stage. If that changes, and as I say, it's a slow process because it's a, really a collection of states, not one state, but that could mark a very big shift in the international system. Coming back to uh, Putin's objectives, and it's clear, like I said, it's not just, you know, uh, uh, liberating one particular region. He wants a regime change in Kyiv. Um, even if he were to be successful in that, if he were to put up a proxy government, one that's much more aligned to the Kremlin's interests, given what we've seen over the last five days and the almost 
cult-like status that Vladimir Zelensky has, has got in Ukraine and around the world. Uh, how much credibility would that new regime have and how long will it, will it even last, given that a majority of Ukrainians you know, don't want to have anything to do with Russia? It's a, it's, a great, uh, it's a great point. I mean, another way of putting it would be Vladimir Putin has been the best thing for Ukrainian nationalism uh, that anyone has ever seen. He has created a Ukrainian nation if there, if, if there was any doubt that it existed. And it did, it did always exist. Ukraine, I think the difficult, it's difficult for other people in the world to understand, but Ukraine and Russia share a great deal of culture and civilizational background, but they are two different countries. Uh, in South Asia, it's not so hard to understand that. You know, there is there are strong elements of shared civilization and culture between India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. But they are now different countries and will remain different countries. That is the nature of the, uh, the you know, the kind of uh, association there. But by his aggressive actions, Putin has strengthened Ukrainian nationalism strengthened, sad to say, the anti-Russian feeling within Ukraine. And so any proxy will find it very hard to survive, very hard to govern, very hard to function. Look, you can get, you can do a lot by sheer force and brutality. And if he is willing to do that, you know, to be, to be like Assad in Syria or the North Koreans or something like that, could they maintain a kind of peace in, in Ukraine? Maybe, but it would be the peace of a graveyard. It would there would be very substantial civilian casualties, uh, and that itself is difficult to imagine. Uh, you know, being possible even for even for the Russian army. Uh, let's talk about Joe Biden. The response uh, from the U.S. president has been a raft of economic sanctions. Uh, how much is riding on the whole Russia story and the Russia-Ukraine invasion for Biden? Because last year. With, with the sort of botch up around the, around the exit of American troops and, and the Taliban taking over Afghanistan, which many said was a foreign policy catastrophe. How much is riding for him personally on how he handles Russia? Uh, a great deal is riding on it, um, but I think so far he has handled this quite well. Um, the, the experience of Afghanistan seems to have served uh, in, in in teaching the administration a number of lessons. First, if you remember, they seemed unprepared and surprised by what happened in Afghanistan. That cannot be said of this case. They were telegraphing early on, we, you know, this is exactly what we think Putin is going to do. Here is how he is going to do it. And one has to say, um, and I have been a critic of American intelligence in the past, in this case, American intelligence was dead on, 100% accurate. Uh, it not only got at the capabilities uh, that Putin was arraying, but it seemed to understand his intentions as well. It laid out, for example, that he was going to go straight to, for, for, for Kiev, not simply the, those two regions that you, uh, that you mentioned uh, in the Donbass. So very good intelligence, very well prepared, and then coordinated action between Europe, uh, the United States, Japan, South Korea, all these countries, if you notice, everything is when working in tandem, everything is moving in synchronicity. Um, and at the same time, some restraint showing the United States is not going to send troops there. You know, Bush's secretary of defense, Condoleezza Rice, Bush's secretary of state, both said that they believe that uh, the Biden administration is playing a difficult hand well, I think is the way Condi Rice put it. Uh, and I would tend to agree. Now, it's a very difficult, complicated game. It's, you know, it's going to go on. Uh, you need patience, you need endurance. But so far, I do think th this reminds me of, you know, in history, uh, John, uh, J uh, John Kennedy had the Bay of Pigs disaster. Mm -hmm. um, and then that in some ways taught him a lot of lessons, which he used in the Cuban Missile Crisis, which he handled much more effectively. I wonder whether in this case, the, the, the failures in Afghanistan helped them uh, prepare themselves to handle this much better. And just as much as the world is looking at uh, every move that the U.S. president is making, they're also watching very closely the moves by China and by China's president. Uh, and although China abstained uh, at the United Nations Security Council vote, uh, its spokespersons of time and again, including today, uh, tried to justify or at least try to give some kind of 
message that, look, Russia's concerns need to be taken on board, so on and so forth. The, the worry is, is Xi Jinping going to look at what, is, what, what Putin is doing and, and tell himself, okay, if he can do this and get away with it, and we don't know, the jury is still out on that one, uh, then can he attempt something similar in Taiwan? So the story for China is very complicated. Um, this, is a, it, this is an extraordinarily awkward and inconvenient situation for China to be placed in. If there has been a central critique uh, from China, from Beijing, about the United States for the last 10 years, it has been that the United States violates the sovereignty and territorial integrity of countries. This is what uh, China said during Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Libya, Syria. And so now what it faces is a circumstance where Russia has violated the territorial integrity of Ukraine, a country that China has good relations with, mm -hmm. um, and it done it in a completely unjustifiable way with absolutely no sanction. Remember, many of the U U.S. operations, Afghanistan, Libya, had uh, a U.N. sanction and had some basis in international law. This is a case where it is a completely rogue action. The Chinese have always been against this, and yet they are now finding themselves having to justify it. So there's that uh, awkwardness and the balancing act they have to de deal with. Y you bring up the issue of Taiwan. Yes, I mean, at some level, if there is a breakdown in the rules-based international system, it becomes easier for China to, to take over Taiwan. But... Uh, I don't think it's that simple as that. First of all, China benefits enormously from the rules-based system, from global trade. You know, China is not a rogue state yeah. uh, in the same way that Russia is. Secondly, uh, China is, I would argue, smarter than Russia on these issues. It's more long-term, more strategic. They face all the challenges in Taiwan that you were asking me about in Ukraine. They face a population that does not want to be ruled by Beijing. They face a heavily armed uh, population, an army that is very well uh, trained, uh, that has been practicing for this for decades, that is armed by the United States for decades. The, uh, the you know, what would they have gained by, by you know, again, it would, be the, it would be a prison house that they would have to maintain in Taiwan. So I don't think they are looking at this as an opportunity to make a move. Uh, for, for the most part, and in the short term, certainly, this is extraordinarily inconvenient for China. This is, um, they, they, they look completely hypocritical on the world stage. And it would be very difficult for them to argue one more, you know, the next time around, it would be very hard for them to talk about territorial integrity and sovereignty being the cornerstones of Chinese foreign policy, when in the most blatant breach that has taken place since 1945, China refuses to even call it an invasion. So China was one of the countries that abstained at the vote of the UNSC last week. The other country was India. And I'm curious to know what, what you think of that decision, because there, there is one school which says, I mean, how can you abstain from a vote when there has been an invasion on the territorial integrity and sovereignty of another country? Yet at the same time, and you know, the, the reality is that even today, uh, India is dependent on Russia overwhelmingly for its defense needs. Uh, so, do, do you allow pragmatism to kick in? I'm just curious to know what you think of the way India voted at the UNSC. I think India's situation is awkward and, and also like China. Um, I think ultimately it's disappointing. For one thing, India has always presented itself as a moral leader. It is the world's largest democracy. Um, it is a country that has always uh, believed in the, uh, in the international system. Uh, and in this blatant violation for India to be on the sidelines, hemming and hawing is sad. I think there might have been a way for it to affirm its friendship with Russia, but at the same time say this particular action we condemn. I understand the problem. I understand that India has very close defense ties with Russia. They go back a long way. The Indian Air Force, the nuclear subs, the aircraft carriers. But I, so I think this may be an opportunity. Let's set the short term moment of the UN vote aside for India to ask itself, is that the right place for India to be going forward? Strategically, the greatest challenge India faces in the decades to come is the rise of China. Yeah. And in an environment where China and Russia have forged an alliance without limits, those are their own words, should India really be entirely dependent 
for its defenses uh, on on Russia. Uh, it, it feels like that there is, you know, that is not the the wisest strategic course, given that most likely in the foreseeable future, India will need deterrent capacity. Again, the issue of India as a moral leader. But let's put that aside. Let's just say pragmatically, where should India be putting its, uh, you know, which basket should India be putting its eggs in? I, I think it may be in the wrong one right now. Uh, and a final word before we let you go. So how do you see the story playing out for the next, uh, the foreseeable future? We know that the talks are on and yet at the same time Putin has put his nuclear forces on standby. Do you see this getting uglier, more bloody, more civilian casualties, turning into a more long and protracted war? Uh, not something that Putin had bargained for when he started it? I think it's very hard to predict, um, you know, as uh, the, the American wise, wise uh, uh, humorist uh, as once said, it's very hard to make predictions, especially about the future. Um, I think that it is likely to get bloodier. And I tell you why I say this. I can't see Putin giving up at this point. He has the firepower to uh, to prevail. Uh, the question is, will he, does he have the, the uh, the brutal, you know, is he brutal enough to use that firepower to its fullest capacity? I suspect he he does. I suspect he will do that. I, as I said, I think that's what the nuclear uh, alert was. Uh, it was a it was a way for him to feel greater flexibility and freedom to use massive force in Ukraine. The Ukrainians will fight back very hard, and as you have pointed out, his demands have become so outrageous. He wants a demilitarized, neutralized Ukraine uh, with this regime taken out with some kind of denazification, whatever that means, meaning, I assume, wholesale cleaning out of the of the entire government and, and uh, the elites. Um, he wants recognition of Crimea, recognition of the two, pro the two independent republics in the Donbass. That is and, and a pledge never to join NATO. Those are the kind of terms you impose when you have totally destroyed a country, when you have totally conquered it. Um, if those are his demands, how does he climb down from them? What is the diplomatic off ramp? You know, I've, I've talked to the Europeans who went in, uh, the governments that visited with him, Schultz from Germany, Macron from, from Paris, and they said they did not get a sense that this was a man who wanted to negotiate. So if that's the case, uh, this is going to get this. This is going to get ugly, and I don't quite see how he climbs down. Uh, it's of course, you know, there there will have to be some kind of brokered solution. Almost all wars end that way, but right now it's difficult to see that. It's difficult to see the light at the end of this tunnel. All right, uh, Fareed Zakaria. I'm not sure that's an optimistic note to end this conversation on, but we're completely out of time. Thank you very much, uh, as always, for joining us with your thoughts and insights. Pleasure to be with you. All right, uh, we'll take a break here on the program, but when we come back, our team of reporters are tracking every angle of the crisis in Ukraine. Up next, we get you reports straight from the war zone from three different cities and what CNN reporters uh, found out all through the last few days uh, in these three different cities. That's straight from the war zone right on the other side.